Have you heard the expression, God or the universe first uh, hits you with a feather and then throws a stone and then throws a boulder? <laughs> and I'm like, I think there were a lot of feathers in my fitness journey. Like fitness was my tool. It like paved the way toward my spiritual awakening, which is kind of cool. But I think there were a lot of feathers and probably small pebbles <laughs> thrown at me along my fitness journey. Up until a few years ago, if you would have asked me if I was competitive, I would have said like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I'm super competitive. Um, the past couple years, I've started to let go of that a little bit, which we will maybe get into. But when I really got into fitness, which was kind of like 2014, um, at the end of really after I graduated college, I got into CrossFit. And it was, you know, anyone, I'm sure even if you haven't done CrossFit, you know, like that just goes hand in hand with intensity and crazy people. Some people call it a cult, you know, which it kind of is, but it's also healthy and fun and really rooted in community. Um, but yes, it is also very intense. Kind of your, your goal for every workout is to go faster and harder than everyone else. And so that that's really where my fitness journey started was really in the CrossFit space. But with high intensity, if you're not also having periods of high rest where you're really, really focusing on recovery, you are going to get burnt out. And this is true in career, in parenting, right? In everything. If you are always going at 100%, your body just can't do that. So you're going to hit a wall at some point. Um, so that happened to me in about 2018. Yeah, that's when I really started. My body was just like, no, we cannot do this high intensity all the time anymore. Um, and I had been learning about nutrition through those years too, but I didn't quite, I still was probably underfeeding myself at the same time a little bit. So then as I was transitioning away from CrossFit, I didn't know what to do with myself. I was like, wait, if I'm not like going at 100%, what do I do? You know, I was still lifting and working out, um, but I wanted to channel that competitive energy into something else. So this is like, oh my gosh, me telling this in hindsight, because, you know, this is over four years ago now. And I'm like, wow, I, I could not sit still. I could not just be with me, which is what I see when I tell the story looking back. But that's what led me to bodybuilding because I had a mentor at the time and he was like, you know what? You, you have great muscle mass from CrossFit for so many years. Why don't you try competing in bodybuilding? And I definitely had stereotypes about women who stepped on stage in like an orange tan and a bikini. Um, but the, the more I started actually researching it, it sounded like a challenge unlike anything I've ever done before. So I was like, you know what? Whatever. Like there are... There was a local coach to me uh, who coached specifically bodybuilders. There were local competitions in Colorado by me. So I was like, I, I think I can do this. Like, let's set a timeline and let's go for it. And I really just dove, dove head first. Like, that's definitely my personality. And really the hardest part about bodybuilding, I think, is, is the dieting. So there's a million components, right? There's... I was probably lifting five days a week. I, by the end of it, I was probably doing several hours of cardio each week too. And then your calories get really, really low because you're kind of, you're judged on your physique. That's what bodybuilding is about. Um, so you're really, really lean. That's why you're tanned up too. That's why you've got a bunch of makeup on too. Because if you were like, I did not look good. Like when I woke up and was just like put on clothes, I looked sick. To, to be honest. Um, so that is why <laughs> you're also covered in tan and makeup and, you know, fake hair, fake nails is because otherwise people would be like, they don't look good, but you look pretty good with the tan on and everything. Um, and then I did, I did really well in that first competition and I kept competing and ended up winning my pro card, my IFBB bikini pro card in 2020, uh, competed through 2020 and then didn't learn my lesson about that 100% thing. So then I slowly 
uh, decided I needed to take a break from bodybuilding too. And that's where my journey really did a 180. And I started moving towards more intuitive eating and a body led approach to fitness. So I think I could probably work with like an inner child therapist for years and still have, still have wounds down there. I have, I think it's important to, to note too, whenever we talk about, you know, like inner child healing or these wounds that we notice in hindsight, like, I had a beautiful childhood. I am very close with my parents even today. They live like 20 minutes from me. Um, but I think, you know, some people use that as an excuse of like, I don't have any trauma because my childhood was just fine and I should only be grateful for it. But, you know, some people call that little T trauma. There are still a lot of those little lessons that we learned as kids to kind of survive and to be shown love and acknowledgement and then they don't really serve us as we get older. So that's kind of what I think of when I think of my childhood, like it was beautiful. I am so, so blessed, but there were definitely some little T traumas that created, molded a lot of my personality traits. And so that competitiveness was definitely one. I have an older brother. We are only two years apart and he has never really been super competitive, but I haven't been able to pinpoint this, but I think that was a big part of my childhood, like always trying to live up to him and seeing how he got acknowledgement and love for getting straight A's, for example. So I would do whatever it took to get straight A's. I wasn't really worried about my own interests. I was more worried about what will give me the most acknowledgement. And so I think that's where a lot of my competitive nature came from. And so, of course, then as I grew into an adult, how I think, I think another theme that relates to that, like chasing acknowledgement is comparison. Then I think they're very closely interwoven because I wasn't really comparing myself to my older brother anymore. I wasn't trying to get my parents love anymore. You know, he was on his own path. I was on my own path. But I do believe I was then comparing myself to my peers especially through, I went to um, a Big Ten university um, in the US and the, the academics were really competitive. So then I was comparing myself to my peers and, you know, like senior year, I remember my stress just being crazy high because my friends got this job offer. And so how do I get a job offer that's as good as that or better than that, right? It's just like, it makes me so sad. not feeling like I was enough. And that's that's probably one of the things that's at the root of it. You know, I have to I have to do something or I have to prove that I am worthy of love or worthy of a job offer after a senior year of college or worthy of um the first place at a bodybuilding competition. My physique has to be better than these other women's to win. So there's and CrossFit too, right? You're, you're literally comparing yourself to those you're working out with. And there's nothing, there's nothing inherently bad about that. I don't believe there's anything inherently bad about competition. Um, I think it can be fun and it can be very healthy. But I think based on my history and my childhood wounds, it was a slippery slope for me to take it to a place that I was actually hurting my body um, hurting my mindset, hurting my relationship with my body and my relationship with food because I didn't feel like I could just be me. I didn't feel like I could just be Caroline chilling, <laughs> working out how it feels good, doing what I want to do. I, I almost didn't, didn't give myself that freedom until I was almost 30. <laughs> you know, have you heard the expression god or the universe first uh hits you with a feather and then throws a stone and then throws a boulder <laughs> and i'm like i think there were a lot of feathers in my fitness journey like fitness was my tool it like paved the way toward my spiritual awakening which is kind of cool but i think there were a lot of feathers and probably small pebbles <laughs> thrown at me along my fitness journey but I didn't really listen until there was a boulder. And that boulder for me was, um, I struggled on and off with disordered eating when I was like 18 through 20, maybe. And then bodybuilding, like I mentioned, the dieting is really intense. 
And that brought a lot of that back um, to a place where I did two professional competitions. And then I was like, this is getting like, this is bad. Like my relationship was suffering because, you know, my poor my poor husband was like, are, are you ever going to just like eat like a normal person? And which, you know, who normal is different for everybody. But I, you know, I understood where he was coming from and it was definitely stressing our marriage. Um, and it was very much stressing my body. I lost my period for a while and hopefully all the women listening have, have heard that, you know, your, your menstrual cycle is almost like your health report card every month. Um, if you are actively menstruating. So there were a lot of warning signs. Um, and that really caused me to, well, it forced me really to say, I got to stop competing in physique and I need to choose other nutrition and fitness modalities that are going to support me and support a changing body. Um, And again, like fitness and spirituality were so intertwined with me because during this whole time, I used manifestation practices a lot with bodybuilding to keep me going. So I did like daily meditation, I did daily manifestation, and those practices were just growing and growing for me. And then when I decided to step back from bodybuilding, I thought like, what's a fitness routine that's going to build my confidence while I put back on body fat? Because I also had to gain weight at that time. Um, And I chose pole dance. (laughs) So I got really into pole dance then, uh, which totally, oh my gosh, it was such a helpful tool because at least like the studio that I work out at, it is all about body positivity, connecting with your body, really seeing yourself. There are so many beautiful lessons I've learned from that. Plus, it's also physically challenging to like learn all these gymnastic skills. So I, I did that. And at the same time, I actually started doing some work with plant medicine. Um, so those everything was like so, so woven together. It was like warning signs from my body, from my physical health, from bodybuilding, time to step away while I had already built this meditation and manifestation practice. And then I had all these other tools kind of come into my life around that same time. Every change starts with awareness. And since I already had some type of downtime ritual, right? I think everyone's mindfulness routine can look, there's a million different ways to like practice that awareness in your life with a morning routine or whatever it may be. And I had the awareness that I needed to stop long before I did. But that's where the awareness piece is so huge. And the more you like connect with that and kind of make space for it, then the action can come. So I think you brought up a great point of like people jumping into, I'm going to be healthy. And then it's extreme. Like we see that so often in with the presence of diet culture all around us, right? Of like, do this 30 day cleanse. And it's like, what happens on day 31? You know, it's, it's, that's like a micro version of being really, really extreme and it not serving you. Right. So as far as like how to change, I think awareness and having some type of ceremony, ritual, something in your daily routine where you're just checking in with yourself is a great place to start. Like as far as even even right when you wake up, right what right when your alarm goes off, you know, you turn your alarm off, take a deep breath and just check in with how your body is feeling that day as you woke up. Like what do you notice? Are there emotions present? Is there um is there a physical sensation that's really present? How's your mindset that day as you wake up? Even just a simple like three minute check like that can go a long way for starting out. And as far as how do you, how do you move forward the way you want to go, but not bring some of those habits, right? It was kind of like the second part of your question. This is where I feel like I was really proactive at that change in my life. Like at the end of 2020, early 2021, I knew it was going to be hard. And so I think... I think almost preparing yourself, like if you've lived one way for a long time and you want to change that, those are habits. You're you're changing daily habits that you don't probably even think about. So the more you can proactively be like, hey, I think this might challenge me at this time of day. What can I do so that when I get to that time of day, there's something easier, 
right? And Atomic Habits by James Clear is a great book to read on that, on habit change specifically. But that's why I specifically like started pole dance. I was like, I don't want to kill myself in the gym anymore. What can I do that's still active? Because I knew I wanted to still be active, but that I think is going to support this change. And I chose that. I also went through all of my social media and unfollowed, honestly, like a lot of bikini competitors, <laughs> which I feel kind of bad saying, but I just knew, I knew how easily I could be dragged back in. I knew how easily I could like take a month or three months off and then be like, just kidding, I'm going to compete again. So I really tried to like clean my slate. Um, and for me, that was social media. It probably is for a lot of people these days. Uh, it, it might be your friend group. It might be someone you spend a lot of time with that they're always the one that you are, let's say binge eating is something I work with a lot of my clients on. Let's say you're always around this person and then you go home and binge eat. And that's kind of like a pattern. Maybe you start to spend less time with that person and in a gentle, you know, loving, kind way as much as possible. So it's, it's really about awareness and then noticing the patterns that are really keeping you in that unhealthy space and starting to one by one, right? Not all at once. It doesn't have to happen in a week. It doesn't have to happen in one day. It can happen over time and just picking one pattern and being like, okay, how can I support myself to choose a different pattern when I know this is going to draw me in? So with that period of denial or like resistance might be another word. Like I knew I had to change, but there was this like wall. Um, and for me, that wall was I had already committed to two pro shows that I was working towards. Even I took like a three month break, but it just wasn't long enough. Um, and I think part of me thought I should just push myself really hard now because then I can be done, which is another kind of trait of mine of like rushing through and getting to the next thing. Um I have an undefined root chakra. If anyone listening is into human design, which you and I were talking about a little bit earlier, uh, that's that's really common of people with undefined root chakras. You want to like clear your plate as fast as possible, but your plate's never clear, right? When we think of like this plate in terms of life or work or whatever it may be, and I really have that desire very strongly. It's something I work on a lot now, but I think that was stronger then. And I was like, let me just get through this and then I'll take a break. When really, like, there's no need to do that. I I think I was caving to, I was coaching nutrition in a different way back then. I was working with a lot of fat loss clients, whereas now I work more with intuitive eating. Um, and so I also felt this, like, pressure that I needed to show up in a certain way. And competing would give me more clients, I kind of thought. So that was like another pressure. So there were a lot of these pieces kind of weighing on me that that kept me in that state of fighting against my body, truly. So I think sometimes you have those and you can push through. I think other times, as long as you're, again, practicing that awareness and you can look yourself in the mirror and make a choice of like, I can change this now or... I need to tell myself I can change this in X deadline. And I do think some people like it did kind of work for me to have a deadline. Could I have had a couple more healthy months of if I would have like canceled those competitions? Probably. But I do also think, you know, I'm not a huge believer in regret. So I think almost pushing myself to then uh, another step further was almost easier than for me afterwards to be like, Obviously, I'm not doing this anymore. Um, so that was kind of what the resistance felt like to me. It was a lot of pressure. It was like I was in a pressure cooker. <laughs> um, but it did also lead to that nice release after. So there are, you know, silver lining maybe. And then as far as when things really started to change for me. So I had been microdosing <clears throat> psilocybin mushrooms for, gosh, probably like two years on and off before that. Um, just to help with some like a mood boost in general. I wanted to, I've always had this draw to nature and I felt like microdosing also really helped me like connect with nature in a deeper way. Um, there are a lot of benefits. I have a whole podcast on microdosing if you're curious, but I kind of had 
that like dabbling experience with our mushroom teachers. And let's see. So where am I at with my timeline? So end of 2020 is when I stopped competing. January 2021 for my birthday, I treated myself to a guided uh, hero dose journey with psilocybin mushrooms. So I took a very large dose with a guide in a very safe space, um, someone I had trusted. I did like two months of preparation work. I took it very uh, religiously or like very ceremonially. Uh, I wanted to really get the most out of it. So this wasn't recreational at all. And that was probably like, if I had to pinpoint when did everything shift, it would be that journey. Um, because it, you know, it was probably like six hours or so of me really just in the medicine, laying down with a blindfold on, just like deep in my subconscious, <laughs> which yes, is a little scary. I know a lot of people are hesitant about that. Um, but I learned a lot. And one of the biggest things from that journey was I was able to see my eating disorder personified and it was, it was not pretty. It was very gruesome uh, and scary and dark, <laughs> did not feel good. But for some reason after that, it was like, obviously I'm never going back there. It was just this clear line in the sand had been drawn of a new respect and viewpoint of my body from there on forward. And that changed, there were so much happened in that journey, but that was kind of one of the big things as far as my relationship with fitness and nutrition and my, my job as a coach. And um, it was really interwoven to a lot of those pieces. So that was, that was really, really important for me. And that, that's when I really started to change my coaching too, away from fat loss and towards more body led coaching. And I really changed how I ate I changed how I moved and exercised even more. Um, and that again, for me, like fitness has really interwoven with like my mindset and my, my mind body health, maybe we should call it. Um, so it was just another beautiful like transition towards a new lens, a new lens for what I more call now like wellness. I've, I've done a couple different plant medicine ceremonies since then and my body has come up in some way. I think, I think almost all of them, um, even though it's never been like a forefront intention of mine, my intention for that journey, I wrote out so many, like while I was preparing, like so many ideas, but what I actually said that day, um, uh, was teach me how to sail more smoothly through life. That was kind of my spoken intention that day. Um, and I'm a firm believer in the saying, like the medicine always gives you what you need. And so I, I think even though I haven't had really anything to do with fitness or nutrition ever, like at the forefront of a ceremony like that, I think it, it has come up in ways that has always really served me in hindsight. A practice that I am still working on, to be honest, which I guess that's what happens when you're unaware of something for like 27, 28 years. <sighs> but it's uh, it's scary is kind of the first word that comes to mind, especially when I felt like I felt like I was really doing a 180 in my coaching because I was, I guess. <laughs> and so there's there were a lot of nerves that went around along with that. Um, but there's just, there's no, there's no reward. Like, oh God, this sounds so cheesy, but I really do believe there's no reward, like being in alignment with what your heart is asking for, you know? And most of my life I was making decisions based on what my mind or my ego wanted or thought was best for me or was trying to protect me through or something like that. But the past couple of years, I've been trying to make decisions more based on what feels good, not like thinking about it and overanalyzing it, right? Because our brains can talk us into or out of pretty much anything. But what actually feels good? What feels good in my body? 
what feels like that yes or feels like a no that I need to say no to. So that's that's been so helpful. And even though, I mean, it has not been like smooth sailing since since I started making decisions like that. I'm constantly learning. I'm constantly stumbling. I sometimes take four steps backwards, you know, and then reorient. But it just feels so much better. It just feels like I'm actually living how I want to live versus being stuck on like a hamster wheel or something. Or, you know, if you reach success, but it's someone else's definition of success. Like I used to set financial goals for myself based on, you know, whatever the business coach guru was saying on social media. And I would hit that and feel nothing. (laughs) I wasn't really excited. It didn't change anything. Um, And I'm like, wow, I'm also setting goals wrong because that is, I don't care about that. I mean, yes, we all need to pay our bills, of course. And I I do enjoy making money. Um, I think that's powerful, right? To, To improve that relationship with money. But at the same time, like that wasn't, I was trying to chase someone else's definition of success. Uh, And that's really common, I think, in fitness and nutrition as well, of like, I need to look like her. What does that even mean for you as a person, right? And like I said, even when I have hiccups, even when I have a quote unquote failure, it doesn't really hurt. It's almost like, oh, okay, well, I can just like redirect versus I feel like when I used to think I failed based on someone else's standards, it like was more crushing And then success based on someone else's standards was also less rewarding. It's like a weird, like double-edged sword. So when you're living more for yourself from your heart, things just, you're just like able to live more, you know, you're able to like experience what I think like my soul came here to experience. Mm -hmm. 